The only thing that happened in this service today, without further delay, I want to bring to this pulpit Brother Elkins. He said we had we'd known each other years ago, and I just kind of had slipped my mind. He said, well, we both had darker hair then. And the more I've, I've uh, been around him, it's, it's coming back to me that we actually did know each other. But more than that, he's a brother in Christ. God is using Brother Elkins in a wonderful way, not only in the United States, but around the world. And revival by design is not just a theme. It should be a purpose. It should be a commitment on our part, not to just accidentally have revival or hope for it. But to prepare and plan and then execute that plan as directed by the Lord. That's what this weekend has been about. Getting ourselves in a place to prepare ourselves for what God wants to do in this end time in Lorain County. So I want to bring to you this pulpit our brother, Doug Elkins. Everyone say God bless Brother Elkins. We give praise to God in this place right now. He's he is so good here in the house. And he is he has come here today to meet your need. He's come here today to fill you with his spirit. He's come here to heal your body. He's here today to set you free. He's here today to take hopeless and despair and fill you with hope. Whatever you need God to do in your life today, he's here to do that. What I need in this place today, God is here to supply that. Yes, he is. And the only thing that will stop me from getting what I need is me. And so I want to get my flesh and myself out of the way and allow the spirit within me to rise up and cry out and step out in faith to God and receive what he has for me. So standing here this morning, I give great honor to Pastor and Sister Harper. Uh, they have treated me so very well. This church has been such gracious hosts, and it has been a, a wonderful weekend already. I'm looking forward to what God is going to do here today. So I give honor to them, to the great work that they're doing here in Elyria. This, this campus and testament that it is to this community that you are here and you are here to help them in whatever need they may have, uh, but ultimately to reach their soul. And to the leadership of this church, I give honor. I've enjoyed getting to meet and work with you these last couple of days. And I'm excited about what lies ahead. The bundle of life you have not experienced your greatest outpouring. That's right. Abundant life, you have not had your greatest revival. Abundant life, you have not That's seen right. the pinnacle of what God wants to do. But you stand on the precipice of a mighty outpouring harvest that God desires to have because we live in the last days. Yes. And you and I are a part of that last days church. And we need to be excited about that. We need to be thankful for that, that God has, has chosen us be in the kingdom for such a time as this. How exciting that is. I, uh, I bring greetings from my wife. I apologize that she's not able to be with me uh, as I shared with them uh, over uh, Friday night. Uh, my wife right now is dealing with a myriad of, of health issues. Some of them have been uh, long term. Some of them have just cropped up in the last little bit. Uh, but she's uh, she basically is really not able to do much traveling right now. And, uh, but anyway, she sends greetings. She apologizes. She's not able to be here. Uh, she did, however, not send me empty-handed. Uh, about three or four years ago, my wife wrote a devotional book on the Daniel Fast. Uh, if you've ever experienced, you've ever done the Daniel Fast, or you've ever contemplated wanting to do an extended fast, 
uh, this would be a great book to go along with that devotional. We give you a devotional every day to read about fasting. People in the Bible are fasting. There's some, really, when you get down and you start researching and start digging out fasting in the Bible, there's some pretty unique characters that we never thought about that fasted in the Bible. And, uh, and so anyway, I've got one of those left. And uh, if, if you'd like to have that, please see me after service. I'll be more than happy to, to, uh, to help you out with that. Uh, but that's not the reason I'm here. The reason I'm here this morning is that God has given me a word. And I know there's somebody here that needs to receive that word. You see, the luxury that I have coming into places like this is that I don't know you from anybody. I don't know your story. I don't know your history. I don't know what baggage perhaps you carried in here. So let's just clear the air up front to let you know your, your pastor has not spent weeks or days or minutes or hours since I've gotten here sharing all sorts of stuff about any of you. He's not done any of that. So what I am going to share with you, what I'm going to speak to you, if it hits you a little bit, I want you to not be upset or angry, but understand that, that God is trying to speak to you. That God wants to do something in your life. God is not a harsh God. You know, we 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 read and and, and uh, the, we were teaching, uh, or Brother Rick was teaching earlier this morning about the Book of Revelation. We we see wrath there, but understand that's that's for a specific cause and a specific purpose. But but God's purpose for us being here today is that he wants to do everything that he can to, to, to help you change your life, to make your life better. Now, that doesn't mean that if you come here today broke that you're going to go home tonight with millions, necessarily, but he can. But it means if you came here today and, and life has just been a, a dark, ugly, gray cloud over your head for days or weeks or months or years, God wants to break through that and to pour sunshine down upon you and let you know He loves you and He cares about you and you are His child. Amen. You see, too often times we as humanity, we get bogged down with our failures. Your failure today does not have to be fatal. Now the Bible very clearly tells us and this is, this is a bonus, so just don't get, this is not even my message, but I just, I, I really felt as the services unfolded that God wanted me to, to speak to somebody here. Your failure doesn't have to be fatal. The, the Bible tells us, it's very clearly stated, that the wages of sin. Now, any of us that have ever held any sort of a job understand what wages are. I go out and labor for X number of hours a day, X number of hours a week, and at some point in time, the boss comes by and hands me an envelope and said, this is what you earned for what you did. We all understand that. Well, maybe some of these little bitty kids know that they will. They will. God tarries, they will. But the Bible tells me the wages of sin. Now all of us need to understand that we are all sinners. All of us were born in sin. I didn't have a choice in the matter. Before I ever took my first breath, I was already a sinner said, the wages of sin, what I am owed for the life of sin is death. Now, that's a pretty bleak picture. I mean, I had no choice in this matter. The Bible tells me I was born in sin. And what I'm owed for being born is death. But I am thankful that it did not stop there. But then it goes on and says, but the gift. You know, never one time can I remember my birthday or at Christmas time that, 
that I had to, to go through a bunch of performances and that I had, to, I had to get down on my knees and grovel and beg and do so many certain things before my parents would hand me that wrapped present. See, a gift is not something that you have to do something to get. A gift is something that is given to you by a person who cares about you and wants to show their love and appreciation to you. The wages, what I am owed for my sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. It lets me know that when I look back and when the enemy tries to, tries to throw up all of the junk of my past, all of my mistakes, all of my failures, and tries to tell me that, listen, you're no good and there's no hope, I don't have to be bound by that baggage, but I can remember the time that I came to an altar of prayer and I poured out my heart in repentance and I asked God to forgive me for those things and God forgave me. You see, that's the beautiful thing about God. No matter what I bring to Him and pour out to Him and ask Him to forgive me, there's not a question mark, there's not a, a, a time that I have to serve before He does that, but it says He is just and willing to forgive us. And so see, all of those things that I have already given to God in, in, in repentance and He forgave me for, it, the only way that those can continue to be a, a, a weight of baggage upon me is for me to go back to that altar and to scoop them all back up and to carry them along with me like a weight that weighs me down. But I'm here to tell you today, whatever you have done in your life, whatever is in your past, that once you have given that to God in repentance, you don't have to carry that baggage anymore. Your failures are not going to be fatal if you give them to God and leave them in His hands. So if you came here today with that weight crushing upon you, I want you to realize and understand, before we walk out of here in a few minutes, you do not have to walk out the same way you came. What a great God. I can't do that. See, because I'm human. And and I've had I've had things happen to me that have hurt me, that brought pain to me. And and I've had people come back and say, you know, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. And, you know, I, I can forgive them. But because I'm flesh, the next time I see them, you know, I can smile and hug their neck and say, hey, how you doing? But there's still something in the back of my mind. Oh, be careful. Remember, see, God's not like that. God says he takes our sin and he removes it from us as far as the east is from the west. He didn't say <coughs> north from the south. Let's, let's do just a little science lesson here this morning. If we were to go out after service, we were to change our clothes, put on our hiking boots, and layer up, and get our compass and start walking north. We would walk and walk and walk and walk until we came to the place that is designated as the North Pole. The very next step that we take in the exact same direction, we are now walking south. And we can walk and walk and walk and walk that same direction, walking south, until we come to that place that is called the South Pole. <clears throat> and then that very next step that we take, the exact same direction, we are now walking north. But, we could dash over to Hopkins International, catch a plane down to the equator, and we could start walking east on that equator. 
And we can walk and walk and walk and walk. We can continue walking that way until all of eternity. And we will never, ever meet west. We will never walk west. You see, God's telling us here, hey, I have taken your sin and I have taken them so far from you that you cannot get them back. Then why? Why do I think I need to keep carrying them around? Why do I think I need to keep letting them weigh me down and keep me from feeling the joy and the peace that God wants to give me? My failures don't have to be fatal. But I've come here today for a few minutes to talk to you about something completely different. But somebody needed to hear that Amen. to be able to receive what you're about to get here. So I'd ask you for just a moment, if you stand with me, I want to turn to the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, a very familiar portion of Scripture, to the 6th verse for a Scripture text this morning. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. It just simply says this. <coughs> but without faith, it is impossible. There are a lot of things in this book that are vague. And they require you and I to do a lot of time digging and reading and praying to get a word from God to help us to see something more clearly. But then there are other places in this word that are just starkly clear. And this, this is one of those places. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. We, don't, we can't twist that or whitewash that or mealy mouth through that and make it say anything different than it does. If I don't have faith, I cannot please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And for just a few moments this morning, I want to I want to talk to you on this on this thought about God pleasing faith. Lord, we are so thankful for what you've already done in this place this weekend. We're thankful for your presence that's here in such a beautiful way. God, right now, all across this wonderful congregation, Lord, I know there are people that have brought needs into this place. Needs, God, that you desire right now in these next few moments to take care of. But God, it is going to take action on our faith. So God, help me now to, 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 to share what you have for us today. God, that we can walk out of here different people and we're going to give you the praise. We ask it all right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 God bless you. You can be seated. Now, I think I'm safe in the assumption here this morning that most all of us, if not all of us, are here and that we are here because we want to please God. Amen. Otherwise, why would you be here? I mean, there's a lot of other things you could be out doing. I mean, I, I'm I'm staying I'm staying right by Midway Mall. That that parking lot's almost empty. You could go over there and spend all day at the mall. <laughs> Couldn't do any shopping, but you could spend all day there at the mall because there's nobody else there. Hardly. Regardless of what level or where your relationship is with God. Our common factor between us all is we're really here because we want to please Him. So the writer says, without faith, we cannot please Him. And if we then turn that around and restate it, it would say then that if we want to please Him, we must have faith. Now, for those of us who are here today and we're facing a storm, Maybe you're in the middle of a storm. Maybe you're facing a crisis. Maybe there's something that's, there's a mountain in your life that's way too big for you to deal with. 
the likelihood is you fall in one of two camps. That one, you're either under the assumption that you just don't have faith to deal with your issue, or two, that you don't have enough faith to deal with your issue. Now give me just a few minutes to lay the foundation here to let you know that falling in one of those two camps, that your thinking is faulty. So let me first speak to the person that says, I, I just don't have any faith. How, how many of us this morning, when, we, when that alarm clock went off and we rolled out of the bed, we walked over to the wall, we found that switch and we flipped it and the lights came on. Now I dare say that nobody here took the time to grab a hammer and a chisel and start tearing out the drywall and the plaster and the trim and to go trace the wiring all the way back to the, to the box and make sure it was all connected. That we didn't go outside and look at the meter to make sure it was spinning or the digits were going around. And we didn't make sure that the, that, that the wiring was still connected from the main source out on the street. No. We just simply walked to the switch and flipped it, expecting, knowing that the lights were going to come on so we could see. Or, or how many of you, before you came to church, went out to your car or truck or your van and you popped the hood and you did a complete diagnostic on your engine to make sure it was going to start? If you're anything like me, the extent of that would be to pop the hood and sit there and say, yep, it's an engine. No. You got in there, you reached in, grabbed the keys out of your pocket, you stuck them in the ignition and you turned it and it started. How many of you that get on a, a, a bus or an airplane or get in a taxi ever take time to stop to the person who's in charge of that, who's flying or driving that and say, are you even qualified to do this? Do you even know where we're going? Do you even know how this airplane operates? No. You go back and you sit in your seat and you wait for your little bag of peanuts and coke and you just assume that that person is going to get you from where you are to where you want to go. You see, we demonstrate faith in so many activities that we do each and every day. But those are really just simply simple tasks. And if we're really going to get down to brass text, they don't require faith because they have become such a part of our life that they're routine. We expect things to happen as a result of an action that we take. So, why is having faith in God so different? Why is it so difficult? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because much of what we seek God for is for things that are well beyond our control. And this creates the need for faith. The doctor gives me a bad report. I can't fix this body. My, my, on my way home this afternoon, my car decides, or my truck decides to give out and I'm stuck somewhere along the road. I, I, I'm done. You know, it, when I sit and look at the pile of bills and then I look at the checkbook and realize these aren't matching up at all, there's only so much I can do. You see, the things that require me to, to utilize faith in God are things that are beyond my control. You know, when, when, when I get up in the morning and I flip that switch and the lights don't come on, I, I, I can generally, uh, to some degree, figure out what's going on. Usually it's a burnout light bulb and I can change that. You know, I, I can check and make sure that, 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 that the pilot of that airplane has, has the credentials to fly. You know, all those things, they really don't require faith. But is it really fair to state that I don't have faith 
that God can do what I need him to do when his word is filled with so many promises already that, 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 that deal with the thing that we probably need faith for. Luke 11 and 9 says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Mark 11, 24 says, What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, yeah. and you shall have them. Yeah. John 14, 14, If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Yeah. Mark 16 says, These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You see, his word has already shown me too many promises that deal with what I'm going through right now to let me know that God has already taken care of the situation. So why? Why do we struggle with accepting what God desires to do in our life. You see, faith is more than just believing. Now, believing is where we have to start. I mean, I can, if I don't believe, I'll never have faith. So belief is a must. Belief is where I have to start. But faith is when I put action with my belief. See, I, I can't get hung up here in belief. Mark 16, 16 says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. See, so right there in just those few little words, it, it, it completely obliterates this thought process that all I have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it's very clear there that belief is a must, but there also must be a baptism that goes along with it. And James here, James here really lets me know that if I'm just simply going to hang on to a doctrine of belief, I, I'm probably not in the greatest of company. See, because James records in, in chapter 2, verse 19, Thou believest there is one God. Thou doest well. And see, if he'd have put a period there, we'd have been okay. But he didn't. He, he didn't put a period there. He put a comma. And he went on and said, The devils also believe. So I'm here to tell you today, if all you're going to do is, is stick yourself at belief and belief in God and think that's going to get you through, congratulations, you're on the same level playing field as the devil. And, and, and I've read enough of this book that I'm convinced I, I, I'd really like to be in a little different place than the devil because I know where he's going to wind up and that's not where I want to wind up. That's not why I'm here today. I want a little different outcome in my life than the devil's going to have in his. So I've got to get past just believing. It takes more than that. But you see, so oftentimes, rather than reaching down within ourselves and praying with faith, it's simpler for us to fall on our face before God and ask Him to give us faith for what we're going through. See, this is a much easier prayer to pray. Because it puts God on the spot, not me. It, it puts all of the responsibility for fixing my problem on Him, not me. But see, God has already made it very clear that He's already given me the faith I need. So now let me talk to the, to the person that here says, Preacher, I've, I've got faith, but the faith I've got isn't big enough to deal with the storm in my life right now. I, I believe God, I believe in God, and, and I've got faith that God can do these, but, but you don't understand what life has thrown at me right now, and my, my faith's not enough, and and, and, you know, I've I just got to spend time before God. All of my prayer time is spent asking God to, God, you realize how big a deal I'm working with right now. And I, I need more faith. 
I've been in your shoes. I understand where you're at. But I also want to tell you today that, that I, I think, because I had to come to this conclusion, I think that you're, you're spending time praying prayers that don't need to be prayed. Now I know, I know that may sound harsh, but stick with me here just a minute because I, I, I want to help you to realize and understand you've already got everything within you that you need. See, in Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, very short little scripture that, that, that clears this up right away. It says, God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Well, okay, preacher, I understand that. I understand I've got faith. I'm not going to argue that point with you. I don't have enough faith. You see, you didn't hear what the doctor told me. You see, you don't see how blown up my family is. You see, you don't understand how big my situation is that I'm facing. You don't understand the obstacles that I'm up against. You're right. I don't understand. I don't realize. I don't know. But God does. And you see, I'm a, I'm a man. And, and it's a lot easier for me when things are spelled out. But, but all, all he said here was a measure of faith. How ambiguous can that possibly be? See, it would have been so much easier for me if, if, if Paul would have written there, unto every man I have given a 55-gallon barrel of faith. Awesome. You know, I can literally wrap my arms around that. I can look at this and I say, look at all the faith I have. If he'd have said a five-gallon bucket of faith. A gallon of faith, a quart of faith, a bottle of faith, a cup of faith, a teaspoon of faith, a thimbleful of faith. See, those are all those are all finite measurements that I can I can comprehend. But he said a measure of faith. Preacher, you're not doing a whole lot to dispel the fact that I don't have enough faith. Hang on. See, here in this one little verse, it deals with both camps. If you're sitting here and you're saying, I, I, I know my problem, I know my God, but I just don't have faith. No, nope. Paul makes it very clear here. God said, I've given you faith. You have faith. But, preacher, it's just not enough faith. See, reality is here that that measure of faith that you have, no matter how minuscule, no matter how little, no matter how insignificant it may seem, is more than enough faith to see what you need happen. Happen. Because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 17, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed. Now, if Jesus would have said faith as a walnut. See, I could have stood up here and even all the way in the back, you all could have seen my faith. I could see your faith. If he would have said faith as a kernel of corn. It's a little hard, but you all could have still seen my faith. He said a mustard seed. A mustard seed is one of the most minuscule seeds known to man. And, and see, that mustard seed, when I pick it up and I put it between my little finger and my fat little thumb, I can come down here, I can get all the way in Brother Rick's face. You don't see it. I don't see it. So see, Jesus is saying here, if you've only got enough faith that you can't even see it. He said, you can say to that yonder mountain, be thou removed, and it will be cast into the sea. He said, nothing, nothing, nothing will be impossible to you. So I have come here today to tell somebody, whatever need you have brought into this place, God has already given you more than enough faith to walk out of here a different person. The only thing that's stopping you from getting that is you putting action with your faith. Is you saying, God, I 
trust you. I believe you. I know you can do it. And I'm going to come up and I'm going to let you do this in my life right now. Whatever you need, God wants to do it in your life here in this place today. Hallelujah. Can you give him praise right now? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you need healing, God's a healer. If you need salvation, God's a savior. If you need comfort, the Holy Spirit is our comforter. If you need a family situation resolved, God is our problem solver. If you need, if your need here is financial, God is our provider. If you're here and you're dealing with an addiction, God is here to break those chains of addiction. Whatever it is that you need in this place this morning, God is here right now to supply that. You do not have to walk out of here the same way you walked in. But you see, so oftentimes we look at the needs in our life. We need the miracle. God, God loves to heal people. God loves to put families back together. God loves to take situations where we just don't think there's a way out. Open a door and pave a beautiful way. But my ultimate step of faith. The ultimate work that God can do in your life and in mine is when I respond to the call of God for my salvation. You see, God can heal my body and cleanse it of cancer. God can take a heart that's diseased and crumbling and put a brand new heart in my body. God can remove all the pain from my body and allow me to walk with and, and to do whatever I need to do without pain. He can, God can take my limited finances and can increase them and make them much. God can take a broken home and can beautifully restore it and put it back together. God can do all those things. But the greatest thing that God can do in our life is to cleanse us from our sin, to apply His name to our life, and to fill us with His Spirit. Yeah. Because you see, what good does it do me to have a healed whole body and still go to hell? But I would much rather, like the writer said, I'd much rather limp and hobble and only be able to half see my way into heaven and make it there. Because I know there I will get my ultimate. I know if God chooses not to heal me down here, I know when I step across the threshold of that pearly gate that I'm going to have a brand new body. Yeah. That all the hurt and all the pain and all the sickness and all the disease, all those things are doing. So I know today that ultimately whatever I have need of in those respects, there's going to be a, a, a miracle happen in that regard. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm ready to die today to get that miracle. But the greatest miracle I can have in this place today is to have carried a life of sin in here and to walk out of here completely set free from that. That I can walk in here, hallelujah, in a cloud of doubt about my relationship with God, and I can walk out of here filled with His Spirit, knowing that if He comes back this afternoon, my life is set and I'm ready to go to heaven with Him. And Peter, Peter explains this so beautifully on the day of Pentecost when he says to them, Repent. When they asked, what is it, Peter, that we must do? He said, repent. Yes. Tell God you're sorry. But tell also tell God that I don't want to go back to that. I don't want to live like that any longer. And then let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now that's not to be put on the church roll. That's not to become a member of the church. That's, that's not just some right or ritual we go through, but there's a purpose because it says that that baptism is for the remission of our sins. Yes. That washes them away from us. That cleanses us from the penalty. That clears out those wages that we are owed. Right. See, and that's 
my part in this whole thing. See, I, I, my faith that God can save me, my action is repentance and being baptized. And then God does his part, as Peter goes on and says, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What a great, grand, and glorious God we serve. He is so amazing. So here in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand. And if, if you've got any sort of a need in your life, if you're sitting here this morning and you're dealing with pain in your body, if you're suffering from an affliction or disease, if you're struggling with some sort of an addiction that just has your life in chaos, if, if your home is, is a little bit rocky. If you need emotional healing. See, we live in a complex world today. You know, so oftentimes when we're talking about healing, we always think about the physical healings that need to take place. But I'm, I know in a congregation of size, I know there are some people in here that are struggling in their emotions. It doesn't mean you're crazy or nuts or weird or anything like that. It just means that the pressures of life have come against you in such a way that, that, that your mind is just in constant turmoil. God can give you peace in that yes. situation. Yes. That even if he doesn't calm the storm around you, he can calm you to go through it. Or maybe you're here. And you have never repented of your sin. You have never been baptized in Jesus' name. You have never been filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. You can walk out of here today a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. So I'm going to ask us to stand. Now the first step we've got to do before any of this can happen is, is we've, got to, we've got to cleanse ourselves. We've, we've got to go through a time of repent. So I'm, I'm going to... I'm going, to, I'm going to lead us here very, very quickly through a prayer of repentance. Now, I can't repent for you because I've got my own things. I've got enough on my plate. But I, I'm just going to ask, don't, don't get caught up in, in what I am saying. But I'm going to ask each of you in your own way to just right now to begin talking to God and, and to repent. God, show me. Is there things in my life that I need to give to you? Are there things in my life that I need to ask for you? For you? There are some things probably you know. The, 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 the thoughts that went through your mind when the guy pulled out in front of you on your way to church and cut you off. And, and you, you maybe didn't necessarily think, well, God bless you. Why don't you come to church with me? You may have thought something completely different from that. You know, maybe you need to, because see, we want to we want to cleanse ourselves so that God can do what he needs to do here. So let's let's take just a moment here and, and, and go to him in a, in a prayer of repentance. God, as we stand before you here this morning, right now, Lord, we know that your presence is here in such a beautiful and an awesome way. But God, I stand here today with needs in my life, needs, Lord, that I know you can meet. But God, I I want to be pure and holy and cleansed as I stand before you. So God, I ask that you would search out my life right now, God. For the thoughts that I have had, Lord, that are not thoughts that would be pleasing to you, God, I ask that you would forgive those. God, the anger, Lord, that maybe I have toward a, uh, a fellow human being, God, I ask that you would help me, Lord, to get past that. And God, that you would forgive me of those, those angry thoughts, God. Sin, Lord, that is in my life, God. Things that I, I have done, places I have gone, things that I have seen or heard or read, Lord, that bring sin into my life. Oh, God, I ask right now, Lord, that you would forgive me of those things. But, God, I don't just want you to forgive me right now, God, but I, I want to turn from those things. Lord, I do not want to turn back to them. But, God, I'm here today, and I want, to, I, want to, I want a life change, God. I want my life to turn around. I want to be different, God, as I walk out of this place than I walked in. God, I walked in here filled with despair and hopelessness, but God, I know right now that you're able to do a work in my life and I can walk out of here with hope. Forgive us, oh God, for those things that we've done that are not pleasing in your sight. And 
help us, God, to become pleasing to you. Lord, we, are, we ask all these things right now in Jesus' name. Now, before, before we go any farther, I'd ask that all across this congregation, every head bowed and every eye closed, and, and I'd just like for you very, very quickly to get your mind on God and allow me to ask you, if there's anybody here today that you need God to do a great work in your life, if you just slip your hand up in the air and let God know, that, Lord, I, I know I need something today. I thank you. Anybody today that's here and you've never really fully repented of your sin and never been baptized in Jesus' name and and you understand and you know that that needs to happen in your life. Do you just be willing to slip your hand up and say, Preacher, I, I, I know I need that. And I, I'd like for you to, to help me to trust God to, to take that step. Anybody willing to just slip a hand up and say that this morning? Anybody? God bless you. Now, still no one looked around. Maybe you're here today and you have never been filled with the Spirit of God. You've never been filled with the Holy Spirit. You've never spoken in other tongues as the evidence. You may really slip a hand and say, you know, I really want God to fill me with the Spirit. I want to walk out of here filled with the Spirit. You just slip a hand up and let God know, God, I'd like to have that happen in my life today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. You can open your eyes now, very, very quickly, very quickly, because there's a lot of people that have needs here today. If you need a healing of some sort in your body, physical healing, emotional healing, spiritual healing, your home needs to, needs to be put back together. You have an addiction that you want to be set free from. Very quickly, I want you to come to the front here and stay in the face, face the front of this building and line up just in front of this front row pews. Very quick.